know what I did wrong. <laughs> Let's start again. All right, there we go. So, <laughs> oh my God, sorry. It's all because Zoom crashed. Normally, I have everything set up and ready like two, three minutes before. Thank you so much, son. You're great. That's my son Isaac. He just brought me some tea. Amazing. What what time is it there, by the way? Is it uh? It is eight p.m. Oh, gotcha. Remind me again. Where are you in Ireland? Is it? Yes, I'm Irish. Okay, very cool. I've never been to Ireland before, but I've heard it's uh heard it's beautiful. So, yeah, it, it is. It is. It rains a lot, but it is beautiful. Like, yep. If you like, if you like trees and grassland and cows and sheep, you'll like it here. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I'll, uh, take a trip over and visit sometime. So, um, so we just like lost the first three minutes of conversation, but I'm not going to try and redo it because that feels awful and fake. <laughs> so, so let's just move on from where we were. What age were you, Damon, when you decided? Actually, first off, I should say you are Damon Nike. Is that correct way to pronounce it? Uh, Nikwet. So. Nikwet. Okay. And you are an entrepreneur living in Miami, Florida. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, been doing copywriting, email marketing, fractional CMO work last couple of years or so here. So what age did you become an entrepreneur and decide I'm going to get into business? Uh, that's a good question. I think it was kind of a roundabout process in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. You know, I think that, you know, I wouldn't consider myself like a true entrepreneur type. You know, I wasn't someone who like grew up, you know, wanting to be an entrepreneur. You know, I, I was an athlete. I want to be a pro tennis player my whole life. Um, that didn't really work out. But, uh, you know, once I got into working, like uh, I took a corporate job when I was 23 and I was about six months in and I was like, damn, I, I hate this. <laughs> this is just brutal. <laughs> um, I can't, I can't stand it. So for me, a lot of it was, you know, I just didn't really like having a boss. I didn't really like having someone who controls, you know, what time I got to show up. And I saw it as, all right, you know, if I work a job, I'm kind of always going to have this. So, might as well start a business and um yeah I just kind of went from there so what was the first thing you did to actually make money for yourself yeah so I think that uh first thing I did was back in about 2017 I, I feel like there's a whole kind of cohort of people for this but I rode that drop shipping trends pretty hard mm -hmm. back in like 2017 to 2019 so um you know drop shipping products from China running e-com stores stuff like that and it's a great experience, honestly. I think that drop shipping gets a ton of hate, but um, I didn't really make any serious money off of it. But it taught me a lot about, you know, Facebook ads, copywriting, um, building websites, CRO. So, you know, it wasn't like a long term thing for me, but definitely uh, kind of got me into the game. So, at what point did you realize that, hey, you know what, this is not the thing for me, and I'm going to actually go get some clients instead? Yeah, it was. Um... It was a tough situation, actually. So, uh, I mean, to back up a little bit, give you some context. So after my kind of corporate job, I took a sales job in New York. So I was selling loans um, and I'd wake up in the morning. I'd wake up at like 4 a.m. and work on my drop shipping stores for like an hour and a half, two hours. Go hit the sales floor, sell from like 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. every day. It was just total grind. And I had this store take off in about November, December, 2019. And mm -hmm. it, was it was starting to do pretty well, you know, it was making like a couple grand a month. So I quit my sales job to kind of go all in on that. And if you're looking at timelines here, that was uh, January, 2020. So, um, you know, COVID hits literally three weeks after I quit my job to go in, all in on these drop shipping stores. So I couldn't get inventory. That was my issue. I was selling, I was making a good amount of sales, but I couldn't get product into the US. So I had to send all of these refunds back um, and I didn't really have a way to get any products. So I was like, you know, I can't keep selling stuff. I have to just refund everything. So um, kind of got into the online business world after that, you know, got into uh, high ticket sales. I was a closer for a little bit, but um, yeah, switched over to copy from there. Okay. And then when you got into copywriting, did you find that your sales experience kind of stood to you that it helped you? like ramp up quickly and become an effective copywriter? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, for me, it's, I see myself as a salesperson first and kind of a marketer second. And um, I think just understanding the underlying psychology, a lot of those aspects of things, it makes you a better copywriter in my opinion. Um, 
like everything I know about copy for the most part, I think I've learned mainly through selling over the phone and I just see it as like translating it into words. Um, it's definitely, definitely a good experience for me. These days you primarily take roles as a, C, a CMO, is that correct? A fractional CMO? Yeah. So I do a bit of a mix at this point. Normally, um, you know, fractional CMO work is, I'm still kind of cracking the model at this point, but I think it's pretty hard to manage more than like one of those clients at a time because it's effectively a full-time job, I'd say, at least the way I'm I'm doing it. So normally I'll have like one fractional CMO client and then I'll have, you know, a handful of email marketing clients on the side. Okay. Yeah. I, I did um, take a fractional CMO role for a few months and I found the same thing. It quickly became a full-time job, even if the intention was only to do it part-time. Yeah, um, it's hard to have strong boundaries because you're taking responsibility for a lot of things and that doesn't necessarily fit into a neat 20 hour a week kind of time block. Yeah, exactly. You know, one thing I found with uh, the role I was doing this past year is, um, you know, A, I think if you're doing the fractional CMO model well, you're probably on heavy rev share. So, you know, you are incentivized, incentives are aligned to, you know, go all in on that one business. But you kind of keep solving additional problems. You know, I got in, I was doing email marketing. Then I started managing the media buyers, the organic people, organic content team. Then I realized, all right, the sales team is, um, we got to scale the sales team up. We only have one closer. So I'm going to hire a setter, going to hire more closers. So now I'm kind of managing sales and marketing. And then, um, you know, that just becomes a full-time job really quick. But I think it's definitely a good morning experience for sure. How did you get yourself into the position where somebody trusted you to um, to take control of actually running their marketing, you know, from being a copywriter? How were you able to make that get, make that move across? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it's I think it's a tough thing to pull off, honestly. You know, like selling fractional CMO deals is. Um, if I look at the landscape of copywriters right now, you know, a lot of people want to do CMO work, but a like I think you need the skill sets, which you know, most copywriters, they don't necessarily have those, but be like the positioning behind it. So for me, I saw it as um, it was an upsell for me. You know, I was working with this client for about six months, um, just managing their email list. And, you know, I probably made them half a million dollars over the course of that period. And they just weren't really doing the things they needed to be doing, in my opinion, you know, like, which makes sense. You know, if you don't have a CMO, if it's just like the CEO of the company, who's kind of head of sales, they're the CMO, head of operations, CFO, like how much effort are you really putting into marketing? So I basically just went to him and said, all right, I've made you a bunch of money on the email list. However, I'm kind of put in a vacuum here. You know, it's like, there's a lot more I can do for you. You know, I've been a sales guy. I know how to manage a sales team or how to work with salespeople. At least I know running ads pretty well. Um, let's give this a shot for a couple months, see how it goes. You know, I'm going to increase my retainer a little bit to make up for the amount of time that I have to put into this. But for the most part, you're going to compensate me off of increase in revenue. So that way, you know, you don't really have a lot of risk here because most of my compensation is tied to, I have to like increase the revenue. Um, so that was my pitch and it, it went pretty well for me. Um, it's definitely drinking from fire hose when you're first starting off with it. And especially with other clients you're managing, you got to stay on top of your time, I'd say. But, um, you know, I think in the right instance, it can definitely be a win-win for both sides. The types of company you were working with, are they primarily coaching businesses or something else? Yeah, I mainly do um, coaches and consults, coaching and consulting businesses. Where do you see the split between coaching and consulting? Um, it's a good question. I'd say, I mean, I see it as like coaching is more so kind of B2C. You know, it's like if I'm going to help with uh, a business that does, helps personal trainers become online personal trainers. That's really more of a B2C offer, in my opinion, versus consulting. I see that as more of like kind of B2B, like let's say I have a client who is placing sales reps or consulting for sales teams. Mm -hmm. I would split it up like that. Um, then of course you have your done with you offers, which I do a lot with those too. And that's kind of um, more on the consulting side, I'd say. 
And do you find in online businesses that typically the responsibility for marketing tends to stay with the CEO even after other responsibilities have been delegated out? You mentioned sales and fulfillment and operations. Yeah, definitely. I would say, um, you know, I've seen this in a lot of instances, just hiring like a good CMO, in my opinion, is I think it's one of the hardest roles to hire. You know, I I haven't worked in like a tech company. I've heard hiring like a CTO is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, though, you know, a lot of companies just have a difficult time hiring, you know, a high level CMO, because I think that there aren't a lot of like full stack marketers, realistically. And the ones that are out there are usually working for themselves. Um, so, yeah, most of the time I've found people like to keep marketing like under the founder of the business, at least until like the very, at least until they absolutely can't handle it, I'd say. When you're in that, you're hired in for that role as a CMO, can it be challenging to actually make the CEO feel or the founder feel secure enough that they can delegate to you, that they can let go of control? Yeah, that's that's a big challenge for sure. Um, I'm sure you've seen this in the deals that you've done, but it's a totally different ballgame. You know, think of it like this. If I'm selling an email marketing deal, worst case scenario here, you know, they're paying me five grand a month on a retainer. They lose five thousand dollars. Maybe I burn the list, which depending on what kind of list it was, unless it was a massive list that was making a lot of money before me, um, there isn't really a lot of risk, I'd say, versus, all right, let's say you're a CMO. Um, all right, if you're spending $100,000 a month on paid ads, you know, you're know you in charge of that. You know, you're not just in charge of the financial aspect of it, but you're also in charge of things like company culture. You know, um, I one of the big mistakes I made, I had a few bad hires, to be honest. Um, I brought in a couple people who, you know, I put a lot of trust in them. And that was probably not the best move on my end. And it definitely was costly for the business. So from a cultural standpoint, that can be that can be detrimental, I'd say. So yeah, you're you definitely hit it on the head there, you know, like it's a big risk to hire for someone for that type of role for sure. So definitely give CEOs like a lot of anxiety in doing it. You talked about a bad hire from your experience of having made bad hires and then having to let those people go and actually undo whatever harm they had done during that period they were employed. What are you looking for now when you were recruiting to make sure you don't make a bad hire again? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a tough one to answer. You know, I think hiring is a skill set in itself. You know, like I've I've probably hired six or seven people over the last year. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of clients of mine, they're hiring someone every single week, you know, um, and I think it takes reps just like anything else. But that being said, I think a lot of it comes down to the role as well. You know, if I'm hiring for like a closer, for example, you know, I'm looking for someone who's confident. They speak with conviction. I want them to close me on the call to close me on the fact that they're the best person for this job. Versus if I'm hiring like a setter, you know, I'm more so looking for, you know, I, I just want them to be a hustler. You know, I want to make sure they're going to like bust their ass for me. If they're not the best salesperson, you know, I'm, I'm not really expecting that. They're kind of an entry level role. Um, versus if I'm hiring a copywriter, for example, I'd say main thing I'm looking for is, well, A, can they write good enough copy? But are they going to meet deadlines? You know, can they take feedback. Well, things like that. So I think one of the hardest parts about hiring is like, you know, different roles require different skill sets and different personalities. You know, it's like for a copywriter versus a closer, two drastically different personalities there. Um, but like anything else, I think it just takes a lot of reps for it. Do you have experience driving traffic or doing media, media buying yourself? A little bit. Yeah. Typically for CMO deals, I'll bring in a media buyer and I'm overseeing it, but I'm more copy focused. I'd say media buying is not really a, a primary skill set of mine. How do you find managing uh, media buying and ma managing a media budget when you're not directly in control and you have to rely on a, on a third person to, uh, to provide you with accurate data and analysis? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think 
Well, A, you have to have like a baseline understanding. You know, if you're if you're going into a CMO deal and you know absolutely nothing about media buying, it's tough. You know, that's the that's the issue I see with a lot of business owners. You know, they'll hire a media buyer and they don't know the difference between a CBO and an ABO. You know, um, they don't they don't realize that uh, you know, cost per lead is probably not like the sole metric you need to look at, you know. Um, so A, you have to know like the bare basics. You don't have to be like world class at it, but um, you should know something about it so that when you go in the ad account, you can see, all right, if this, you know, if this ad set's completely underperforming, you know, I can call my media buyers out on that. But B, in my opinion, I think the best course of action for working with media buyers is, you know, something, something that you're really good at, actually, you know, networking, you know, you need to know people. End of the day, it's like, um, I just have a couple of go-to media buyers who I've worked with for several years now where I know for a fact they're going to do a damn good job. You know, if I can bring them in for a client, I know that they are really good at what they do and they're going to do a good job for my clients and I can, you know, have their back vouch for them. Um, I think that's the most important part, firstly, is just having someone you can trust for the role. You mentioned one of the key things for a copywriter is uh, being able to, to take feedback. And yeah. I know from writing copy, that's actually quite a hard skill to yeah. learn. Like it's a, for some reason, when you write and you show it to somebody, you can, it's very easy to get very precious about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you actually get around that when maybe people are very sensitive about their work in actually getting them to understand where you're coming from? Yeah, that's a tough question, John. I'd say, um, you know, because that's very true. You know, it's when you look at giving feedback, it's if I'm giving feedback to like a closer, for example, you got to be kind of like 75% positive and then 25% like here's some constructive feedback versus if I'm copy chiefing work it can be kind of brutal. You know, it's just <laughs> on every line by line and just come for their life a little bit. It, it can come off a little bit harsh. Um but that being said, I remember when I was burning copy, I had a guy, his name's Mark Coulter. He was mm -hmm. uh, taught me pretty much everything I know about copy. First couple of months there, I was like, ah, oh, this is this is rough. You know, <laughs> it's just getting roasted every single line. But I also know like that's that's the reason why I'm good at copy. You know, I wouldn't be good at copy if I didn't have a, a really good copy chief who was just riding me like every day on it. So I think that's one of those things where if a copywriter can't take feedback, um, just being honest, I probably wouldn't hire them in the first place. You know, if, if they are, I would rather take a copywriter who is, you know, a, a B skill set, maybe a B minus skill set, who I know can take feedback, implement it, um, and do better with it than someone who's like an A minus, but they've got kind of an attitude, you know, they're not willing to make changes because, all right, let's look at it from the client standpoint. You know, if a client tells me to make a change, I've got to make the change. You know, it's like, um, I, I think I hold good frame with clients, but at the same time, if, if a client doesn't want to be represented in a certain way and I don't do what they say, I'm going to just turn the deal. Then we both kind of lose. So um, if they can't take feedback on what I'm saying, they won't be able to take feedback from the client. And then it's kind of a lose-lose across the board. So I'd say it's it's tough, but I would probably just not hire someone who isn't adaptable and open to feedback. Sure. And yeah, I've had that experience before. And I've been that person and learned from that experience of thinking that you're 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 hired to write copy and let me write copy. You know, that kind of the ogle the idea of why buy a dog and then bark. Yeah. But again, if you if you're coming in, you're coming in as a hired copywriter, you're there for a little while. And you don't always have to live with the consequences of your work. So if the client, even if the copy road is good, if it misrepresents them or if it's too aggressive and doesn't match who they want to portray themselves as to the world, or if they feel that, you know, it's, it's overstretching on the claims or that it's going to do stuff that might affect customer experience or increase the refund rates, they will say, hey, look, this is, this is a step too far for me. Pull it back. And I think copywriters are can be sometimes not understand all the important reasons why even if the copy is good it might need to be changed yeah 
Yeah, totally. Um, you know, to give you an example here, I had a bit of an incident with a client a uh, couple months back um, where, you know, my copywriter would be, he'd, he'd do a strange sign off, you know, in the client just kind of like to be very straightforward to the point, like um, write the email at the end, book a call now, you know, insert name. Um, and he'd kind of beat around the bush a little bit, you know, um, and the client was getting annoyed with it. And I just told him like, don't, you can't do this ever again. It, you know, sorry, the client's mad, you know, and he never did it ever again. And it all, it was perfect, you know, um, versus if I've got a kind of fight with my copywriter to do that, um, cause they have an image for how this is. And the client has an image for how it is. The client wins out, you know, it's their, it's their say at the end of the day. So gotta, gotta keep them happy. I talk to a lot of people every week, um, between media buyers, email marketers, BSL copywriters. And a story I keep hearing lately is just a lot of um, kind of high ticket type offers where they're selling more expensive products like 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, that things are a little bit tougher in the environment this year than they were even four or five months ago. Are you seeing that as well? And what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's um, definitely something I'm seeing for sure. I would, in my, my kind of general diagnosis of the market right now is a lot of the high ticket B2C purely coaching type of stuff, it's really having a hard time. You know, just selling, say, a $5,000 package, get a course, get a couple calls a week. That's having a rough time from what I've seen. However, I would say more the done with you offers, you know, I have a client that does Airbnb arbitrage, you know, they, they sell $14,000 done with you package, they find a location, set up all the marketing, kind of just do everything, then pass it off to the client, stuff like that, that's doing really well right now. You know, it's like a lot of these people, kind of the biz op crowd, I'd say, I feel like they have kind of sophisticated back past the point of wanting information, they just kind of want it handed off to them. And I think people who are providing that, in my experience, are doing very well this year. These types of offers like Airbnb arbitrage, these kind of higher end offers where there might be ticket prices of like 15, 30, 50,000 in case, some case and higher. Those offers are by their very nature, maybe like lower volume. Um, a little bit harder to kind of uncover them and know what's out there. How do you actually find interesting offers and approach companies to work with them? Yeah, that's, um, so at the moment, I feel like people just kind of find me, to be honest. Um, I don't really do a lot of outreach these days. Uh, you know, I mainly just post content. You know, I post a lot of content. I try to post every day. I go to a lot of live events. Um, and people just sort of come into my ecosystem. You know, it's, it's pretty rare. I'll send like a outbound DM to someone unless, unless they see something where it's like, all right, I really want to work with this person and I know I could crush it for them. Um, then in that case I will, but for the most part, people just kind of, uh, tend to find me. I don't really go looking for it. I'd say. Okay. When did you actually get to that point in your career where you were no longer doing the kind of, uh, searching for work and then work started to find you? Um, I'd say about a year and a half ago, somewhere in that range, you know, I was, um, I worked for Joel Kaplan's team at agency lab in-house for a couple of years. And then I went and worked for Cole Gordon's team at closes IO. I was his head copywriter for a little while. Once I broke off from there, um, you know, Cole has a very good network I'd say. Um, so after, after I stopped working for Cole full time, which was March of last year, I believe, March or February. From there, I mean, I've always kind of had a pretty packed schedule, you know, just a good amount of inbound leads from there. And that was, is that primarily been from the contacts and the network you've built up during the period of working with those companies? Yeah, that's right. I think uh, one of the great things about like being with coaching companies is like coaching companies, they they have clients, you know? Um, so it's easy easy to do deals with those clients, essentially. People are seeing you involved in the actual, in the business. And when they have an opportunity to work with you, they'll approach you. Pretty much. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, I personally believe the game of copywriting 
more so more so the business of copywriting, I'd say, uh, and getting deals, getting clients. I, I think a lot of it comes down to just positioning, you know, and I think when people start to kind of associate with you as like this person's copywriters, you know, you're you were Cole Gordon's copywriter or you're Jeff Seconder's copywriter or you're Joel Kaplan's copywriter. Like people kind of people think of you in that light. Um, and then that, that just makes it really easy to clients, you know, um, when there's that association there. Have you always, since the beginning of doing this stuff, like been creating content and putting out content to talk about your own journey, or has that been a more recent thing? Uh, so that was, I'd say I've been doing it for about two years now. Mm -hmm. Um, a friend of mine, uh, his name is Brandon Spears. He's a pretty big time media buyer. He kind of put me on to this strategy. It's, I'd say in a nutshell, it's very similar to Russell Brunson's like Dream 100 strategy of, uh, you know, and since then I've been posting daily content for about two years. And yeah, I mean, I know you do a ton of content. I see, I see you every day on Facebook. It's, it's impressive. <laughs> your, your consistency is relentless. Um, not only with the posts, but also like the, the commenting, staying up to date with other people. Um, but I've been doing it for about two years now and definitely one of the best kind of moves I've made business-wise, I'd say. Are you thinking about a certain person when you're writing or are you just kind of going with the flow of what happens in your life and in your business? Yeah. So I'd say a mix of both, you know, for me, um, I think a lot of people struggle with making content and for me, it's the opposite. Like I have a never ending, I have no shortage of ideas for content. Like, I just kind of take what's in my head and put it on paper and I'll write a long post. It takes me 90 seconds. Um, cause I'm just transcribing my brain essentially. Um, but I try to keep in mind, you know, I, I write for my clients, you know, I write for business owners, coaching and consulting businesses who are making three to $5 million a year, spending 50 grand a month on a BSL funnel, um, and have an existing email list, you know, like my, my content for the most part is I try to gear it towards them because, uh, you know, end of the day, this is a business, you know, I'm writing for potential clients. Like for me, content's fun, but there is, you know, a business element to it. I'm trying to get clients out of it. Um, so I try to keep that in mind on most of my posts. Do you still find yourself writing copy when you're in the CMO role or do you kind of take a step back from that and just take more of a, a management and supervisory role? Yeah, I still write a good amount, but I'd say the difference is, and I'd, I'd assume you probably have a similar situation, but if I'm doing more of the high, high ROI stuff, you know, I'll write a VSL, you know, or I'll write the ads, um, or I'll do a variation in the VSL. But I, I, in my CMO deals, I'm not really doing, you know, the daily emails, stuff like that, the IG content, kind of more the busy work. But when I do write, which isn't nearly as often, it's, kind of like, uh, it's important, I'd say. It's like a very important piece of copy every time I write. So a little bit different there. You talked about events. Can you talk a little bit just about the experience of the events you've been to and what the outcomes have been of, of attending those? Yeah, totally. So events, I love going to events. You know, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of copywriters are kind of introverts, you know, they, they like to kind of sit in their cave and like, you know, write copy all day long, um, not really talk to people. And I think they're leaving a lot of money on the table because of it. You know, most of my clients, my, my kind of funnel per se is I go to a live event, I'll meet a bunch of people, I'll create a bunch of not only potential clients, but also like potential referral partners, people who will send me business and people who I can bring to my clients to help them in something that I don't do realistically. Um, so I'll go to these events. I'll just meet all these people, get them on my Facebook, and then they'll follow my personal email list or something. We go from there. And um, I mean, they're fun. I, I enjoy the events. Uh, they can be expensive sometimes, but I think there's a huge ROI to it because I, I look at it like this, John. You know, if I start working with a client, a lot of copywriters, they come in and it's like, all right, I'll manage your email list. But my kind of value proposition is, okay, if I'm going to come in and manage your email list, I'm not just going to manage your email list. If this deal goes well in hopefully like three to five months, I might be able to work as a fractional CMO for you and just take the whole thing out of your hands. And I can introduce you to Russell Brunson's main media buyer. I'll bring him in. 
he can manage your traffic. And I've got a killer guy for IG Organic. And I know a couple of really good heads of sales who I can bring in. And they know good setters and closers. And I know funnel builders. You know, I know all these people from like various different routes. So I'll come in to a client and kind of bring like a team with me. And I think it just creates a much better experience for the client because I can help them in multiple ways. I'm not like charging a recruiting fee or anything like that, but um, it helps them. Plus it helps the people I meet at the events too. You know, it's like um, that way I can be someone who provides value to them. I can bring them clients um, and then they bring me clients. It's kind of, um, you know, I think that's one of the biggest values to these live events is like on, you know, you do a really good job of like connecting with people DMing people, setting up calls. I, I'm not the greatest at setting up calls. I need to do a better job with that. Um, but if you're not doing those things and you're not going to live events, you don't really have like a good inflow of people into your network. Um, so live events, I'd say that's the biggest value from it. You just, you meet a lot of people from it. I mean, the live events are great. I, I mean, I've, really got no opportunities to come to the US because you know I've got a young family still. It just doesn't make sense to leave home and travel. But um and that's why I've actually gone down the route of like focusing on networking via Facebook because yeah. it well it was what was available to me. And I knew just like you say that if you don't build relationships with people, you're just gonna get nowhere. Like you, your skills are are completely replicable. People will work with you because they they feel like they, you're somebody they can trust and they have to get to know you to get to have that feeling. Yeah, totally. Like that's something that um something I think that really has always stood out to me about like your brand um, and just the, the way you present yourself online is um you, you just come off as very like trustworthy. You know, it's like you, you know, I had never like hopped on a call with you before this call here, but I trust you, you know, it's like just based on how, how you present yourself. Um, you, you've like brought opportunities to me on like multiple occasions, you know, like, Hey, I've got a client, they need help with this. Are, could you fulfill on that? Like, I, I appreciate that, that I really appreciate that, you know, and not a lot of people do that, you know? Um, and I think that makes you, that just makes you so much more like trustworthy to, to everyone, which everyone values that like people want people that they can trust in an online environment. It's harder than ever to trust people. So you have to like, create those ways to, um, you know, build that trust in potential clients, potential referral partners, you know, whoever it is. So. I don't like to talk, to use the kind of language of abundance to, as much, because I think that can be, you know, you can sort of veer off into the woo, woo a little bit with it. But the reality is, is as a, each of us only has a certain amount of capacity for things we can do. And there can be this kind of, um, you know, the, the monkey part of us is very greedy. And when opportunities start to come more than maybe we can potentially fulfill on, there's a little voice in it said saying, say it's everything, grab it all, grab it all, grab it all. But when you yeah. do that, inevitably things go bad. They go south and you get burned because you just can't fulfill on all the things you said yes to. And so I've learned the hard way and it didn't, it wasn't just one time. It's taken me many times to learn this lesson that there's a kind of limit where you get capped out and you can start to feel internally that things are not right like you know you're just confused all the time because you've got too many different responsibilities that are coming at you from all directions and when i can start to feel that feeling if the next opportunity that's coming to my door i'm like i want to say yes to this but i know i can't i have to give this thing to somebody else i have to get it away from me as quick as i can or i'm going to be in yeah. real trouble soon so it's like who do i know that will do a good job of this and then i'm going to bring it to that other person and say, Hey, would you like to, would you like to do this and make the introduction? And and this, the long-term benefits of that are obviously a, the person who comes to me gets their work fulfilled. So even if I didn't work with them that time, maybe it would be another opportunity. The person I introduced to them is um, happy to have an opportunity brought to them that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten. And I, you know, have solved a problem of not doing the thing that I know is more than I can potentially take on right now. And um, I also have the situation where, you know, in, in both of those people's eyes, I've, I've helped them out. And so everyone kind of wins. And I know long-term that both of those people will come to me and talk to me again. 
and we'll we'll have some opportunity to do business in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think um I think that's really key. You know, when when looking at things on like a long term time horizon. You know, I remember, you know, when I was just getting started in copy, it was it was just a bloodbath. You know, it's like can't get clients. I don't know what I'm doing. And you know, I had a couple of people who sent deals my way, and I'm like forever grateful to them. You know, I will bend over backwards for them for probably the rest of my life because they they helped me out when I needed a lot of help. Um, and something something that I've tried to internalize over the last year, a guy named Jim Hamilton, he put me onto this, and I thought it was really interesting. But when you look at the concept of like networking, looking at your network, a lot of people look up; they only look up. You know, they're only looking at, okay, um, John is trying to network with this guy who's worth $10 million, you know, and is a potential client and can send a bunch of people my way. But they don't necessarily look down. You know, they don't necessarily look at people who are like a little bit earlier in the game, can't necessarily like provide immediate value to you today. And that's that's like not a good way to look at it. You got to look both directions because, um, you know, in the future, you need like allies and stuff like right now i'm kind of at a stage I'm, i've actually been looking for a business partner for like a really long time you know um am i gonna go partner with someone who is worth 10 million dollars probably not it's probably you know it's probably not gonna happen realistically i'd say it's much more likely for me to find someone who is i see as like really talented they just haven't necessarily like made it on paper yet you know they're like they're on the come up but they haven't really cracked the code yet. And I think the only way you can do that is if you're like providing value to both people above you, but also people who are kind of like below you who are still a little bit earlier on. So I, I like to look at it, you know, both ways. Yeah. There's, I think there's a third category as well, and that's looking sideways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as well as up and down, there's the sideways who are people who are kind of in a similar spot to you, but maybe doing something slightly different or doing something similar to you, but in maybe in a different way or serving a different type of person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like, if I've got a deal and I can't take it on, you know, I closed a handful of deals like this week alone. So I'm basically at capacity right now. If I want to hand off a deal to someone, I want to make sure they do a good job, you know, and I'd say I'd probably like to send someone who's like kind of similar level as me there. Um, Cause like, I don't want to send them someone who's going to charge them 10 times what I'm charging. But at the same time, I want to make sure they're they're solid. They're going to do good work for the person. So, yes. And so, you are intending to launch some of your own offers this year. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I actually just launched one uh, last week. Actually, oh, fantastic! Um, yeah, made. Uh, I mean, I did a beta launch for my internal email list. Just just a course for now. I'm going to make it into a whole program eventually. Um, but yeah, I got the first sale, so that was pretty exciting. Awesome. What are you teaching? Uh, so I did a core, I did a program on essentially lead quality. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I feel like it's one of those things that a lot of people disregard it. You know, no one really talks about like a process for improving upon lead quality. You know, a lot of these people in the high ticket space, when they're struggling with lead quality, their whole thing is like, they try to increase the lead volume, you know? Um, instead of trying to get better leads in, they're focused on just bringing in more volume and getting more deals as a result of that. So um, I have a pretty good process as far as like dialing in lead quality for my clients. And I'll talk about it on a lot of my consulting calls and people seem to find it like pretty valuable. So I basically just packaged it, packaged it up, threw it in a course and um, got a few sales. So it's pretty exciting. Awesome. At a high level, can you talk about your your process for, for increasing lead quality, at, particularly at the top of the funnel where you're actually regenerating the leads? What are the important things that people maybe don't pay attention to enough? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, number one, first and foremost, you got to know who the, like, what is a quality lead? You know, I think that's the biggest problem a lot of these businesses face is they're just going off of word of mouth from the sales team. You know, the, they're talking to their closers, closers are coming back. Oh, the leads are trash. The leads are garbage. And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, like, okay, what we got 30 leads today. What percentage of them were trash and why are they trash? You know, like, is it, are they the wrong industry? Are you selling to roofers and dentists are coming through your funnel or is it more so, all right, you want established roofers with the team of 10 
but you're getting roofers with a team of two in. You know, how, how will we define what the issue is? So first and foremost, I think you have to get a lot of clarity surrounding, like, who are you actually targeting? Um, next from there, I think you need a data-backed way to measure it. You know, like kind of similar to the issues with closers saying, like, just kind of word of mouth, the leads are bad. Um, how do you quantify that? You know, if you're running a VSL funnel, you're not going to have 100% of your leads coming in 100% ready to go, ready to piff on the first call and fitting every single category you want. That's unrealistic expectation. If you're doing an outbound sales model, you know, sure, you can validate who you're reaching out to, but off paid ads, it's impossible. So you need to have like real data behind like how to track lead quality. Um, third from there, I'd say like just really dialing in the messaging, you know, basically the stuff that we do all day long, speaking to like your ideal prospects. Um, I think a lot of people make decisions surrounding kind of what optimizes for almost like what optimizes for the media buyers, you know, what's going to get us the cheapest cost per lead. What's going to get, you know, the, how are we going to get traffic as cheap as possible? How do we, and that just results in like, <laughs> just biz up prospects. It's biz up all day long. People with five hundred dollars in their bank account. When you're trying to sell something for ten k, it's like um, you know, you got to be able to speak to I'd say a higher level avatar, um, which I think is a messaging issue. Um, and then from there, having a clear process surrounding like surveying clients. You know, surveying clients. Who are your ideal clients? What are they saying? Talking to them. Talking to your salespeople who close them getting ideas from them in terms of how to structure your marketing. Like, I think if you can execute on those, um, the marketing becomes very easy after that. I'm laughing because it's just does all of the things you're talking about is the problems. They're ones I recognize. Like you're on the, <laughs> you're on the sales, on the sales team call. And they're like, one day the leads are great. The next day the leads are trash. And the media buyers, they're, like, they're the same leads. <laughs> and, and really their, their perception of if the leads are good or bad often comes down to just their subjective feeling if they're having a good day or a bad day. Like It's a, it's always yeah. a mirror of their own emotional state when they're on the <laughs> phone with people. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, back to the CMO stuff, I'm sure you deal with this all day long, but I would argue the single most challenging aspect of CMO work that most copywriters are probably not too familiar with is uh, sales team management. You know, you're managing the expectations of a bunch of sometimes very angry salespeople, um, which is, it can be very stressful. You know, it's, I've been a commission only salesperson. I know what it's like when lead flow just drops off a cliff and ad account goes down and you've got a whole group of people yelling at the CMO. Like, you know, you can't really change things like a broken ad account overnight or a shutdown ad account. But I think being able to deal with that, being able to like kind of um, effectively work with salespeople, really, really high value skill, not an easy one to cultivate, but uh, definitely one to learn for sure. The opposite side of that, which you also spoke about a moment ago, is the uh, the media buyers optimizing for things that don't really help the sales team. Like they're looking to cut down the lead cost so they can say that they're, you know, they're improving the budget or they're saving money for the business. But oftentimes they're not actually speaking to the sales team and finding out if they're sending the right people through or they don't have a clear idea. They often feel that once the lead has been delivered into this into the hopper for the sales team or the, the appointment setters, their job is done. But of course it's not. Yeah, exactly. It's that's one of the challenges with working with media buyers, in my opinion. And also a big part of why companies need a CMO is because there's the incentive incentives are not always aligned. You know, um, media buyers, they're they are kind of button pushers. You know, they see $30 cost per lead. They think killing it, you know, um, they're not necessarily looking at like, okay, what's the cost cost per acquisition? You know, how is that relative to, um, you know, what the sales team is collecting up front and how are, you know, what's our lifetime value here? Um, like I'd rather pay more for a client or I'd rather pay a much higher cost per book call and get good leads in who the sales team can actually close than just have kind of that mat vanity metric of really cheap cost per lead. But, you know, the leads are a nightmare. The sales team can't close them, um, which I think is like, you know, the incentives are not necessarily aligned because the media buyer wants to get things as cheap as possible because that makes them look good. But at the same time, that's not always what's you know best for the business as a whole. I think also from the media buyer's perspective, there can also be fear that if the lead costs start to go up a lot, 
they're going to get you know chewed out by the company leadership like you know you're we're you know we're we're setting our money on fire here or we're spending so much money on traffic every day and you know they are almost afraid to spend to spend more per lead sometimes because they feel like they're going to get shit first and they're worried then that the the actual it's out of their hands in some sense because then they still have to go to the sales team sales team still have to close them and it can be very difficult yeah it's uh, being a media buyer is it's a stressful position you know you're in charge of a lot of money a lot of times um and a lot of times like you'll hear all right let's say i i like to track cost per mql book call you know qualified call essentially and a lot of times i'll face like a six seven hundred dollar cost per qualified call which your average business owner is going to hear that and they're just like that we can't have that absolutely not um when you run the numbers on it it's actually very feasible you know it's like a 25 percent close rate on six hundred dollar cost per qualified call you know that is um twenty four hundred dollars cost per acquisition if you're selling a ten thousand dollar product it's fine that's it's not perfect but it's good enough i'd say but the business owner is going to hear that 600 and lose their mind, you know? And I think that comes down to managing expectations of the client. It's not always easy, but um, got to do it. So, yes. Oh, look. The, and the problem being in our industry, it's like everyone has to be, everyone's expected to be super optimistic all the time. So you're almost, you're punished if you're not. So, um, <laughs> And and that's why setting expectations, I think, can be so hard because people want you to come in and to be super confident to say, we're going to crush this and, you know, make it sound like everything's going to be great. But inevitably, there's, there's always going to be challenges. And it kind of sounds from what we've talked about today that you're you're kind of the person who has to be the glue between a few different people inside of a business, between the sales team, between the media buying team, between oftentimes the finance team and actually the founder themselves, who is the one who essentially has to take responsibility for everything or live with the consequences, but also understands that they need to, to delegate to grow. Yeah, totally. That's, um, that, that's been a big transformation for me over the past year. You know, I'm used to being a copywriter and being a salesperson. Like I, I do the work, you know, I write the copy or I take the sales calls and kind of getting into a place where it's like, all right, I'm more so leading. I, I'm delegating. Most of my time is managing people nowadays. And when those people, mess things up, you know, I'm the one taking the heat, which, which can be a little bit stressful sometimes. But, um, you know, I think learning how to delegate, learning how to lead groups of people and keep everyone on the same page, you know, that's, that's not easy. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things that I deal with is um, just getting, getting sales and marketing on the same page, getting everyone to know what's going on, know where the problems are, diagnose the problems, create real solutions to fix them. Um, it, it's a tough part of the job for sure. And something that's pretty new to me still, but. You have your own uh, mailing list that you maintain. Who are you writing to? Uh, mainly just potential clients, I'd say. Um, I, I need to be a little bit better at hitting the list, but it's, only, it's pretty small. I've only got about 400 people on there right now. Um, but mainly people who I could do deals with. Um, for me, my list is kind of like, I don't even really get a lot of clients out of it. It's more so just, I take learning lessons, things I'm thinking about, just throw it out into an email, like to kind of document things. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the main purpose of it. Okay. I, I've kept a list for a while, but I found it's just the, well, one of the difficulties, and I think, you know, some Ben settles like email berserker software, people say this kind of goes some way to solving that challenge, but um the immediacy of open Facebook, you know, have a moment of inspiration, open Facebook, write the post, post it, get instant gratification. It like, it's just so much simpler than the number of steps you have to go through to send an email to your list and still won't really know for maybe 24 hours or, or more if it, if it generated a positive response. Yeah, that's, I mean, I guess I'm a bit of a hypocrite because I'm an email marketer and it's what I do for clients. <laughs> Um, you know, I kind of like being able to interact with like, you know, see what people think about things and stuff. You know, if you write an email, how many people actually respond to your emails? Like most of the time, the only email responses I get are is if someone's pissed off about something. Um, but a lot of times I'll come to live events for someone who's on my email list and they'll say like, oh, you write awesome emails. 
but I don't really have a way of knowing that on email versus on Facebook. If you write a really good post, people interact with it. You can see what they're thinking about it versus email. You're, you're just kind of sending it out into the void. Um, so yeah, I prefer the Facebook element, although I do want to switch more so to Twitter or, or X now, I guess we'll call it, um, and YouTube, but I, I do love Facebook. been doing it for a while now. Yeah. I, I've done the same this year. I mean, well, I'm doing these interviews every week and this, type of interview actually like serves multiple purposes for me. Can you hear my dog barking? You're uh can you, you hear a dog barking? Oh no, you're good. Mm. Okay, no, she's she's growling at somebody. There's supposed to be somebody <laughs> out of the street and she's not happy. She's very territorial. Take a look. Shh, shh, shh. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> she jumps up on the windowsill behind my computer. So I can only, I can kind of see her under the desk and she's just staring at the window, growling at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've forgotten what I was going to say. Ah, yes, I these co these calls. I mean, they're a form of network for me. They get me an opportunity to meet people I haven't otherwise had the chance to meet and have a conversation with them. Um, they're a piece of content. I publish an interview once a week. Is it? And um, they, you know, I have a very small YouTube channel, maybe four hundred subscribers. But I know that there are people who watch these interviews. So it, it does bring people to my door. And then the other benefit is that later on, if I'm talking to somebody new who doesn't know me, I know they're going to go and do a Google search for me, you know, after the conversation. And they're going to probably find me on YouTube because YouTube is such a great, you know, it's so it's such a high ranking in SEO factors that um and then people can see, oh, this person's been doing something for a while. They've been around a while. They're a real person and they seem to have, you know, a bit of content out there. So it's really, really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like if, um, if a potential client is looking at hiring you and versus some other copywriter, they, they hop on your YouTube, they'll see like, okay, you interviewed Chris uh, Zankowitz or, uh, you know, I, I met Donnie French. I know you guys know each other. Maybe yeah, he's a, a wonderful guy. Um, yeah, like yeah, they'll see like, all right, this guy's interviewing like really high level people like that. You know, it's your positioning is just so much better, you know, when you when you hop on those calls. So, yes. Uh, um, yes, it, re it really makes a big difference. Twitter has been kind of a new initiative for me and um, I, I love it. It's really good, but it's harder to crack in terms of like understanding. Um, yeah, there's a different way of communicating there. It's it's like people are using long form on there more than before now, but it's, it still takes a bit of understanding how to actually enter a conversation on Twitter. It doesn't have the same immediacy of something like a Facebook. You know, it's not so simple. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a learning curve. I'm still figuring it out. Um, I'm really sorry, John, I've got to go in a, in a sec here. Um, but it's been super awesome connecting with you here. I'm, I'm super excited to see you like getting this YouTube channel off the ground, doing these interviews. Um, not a lot of people are doing this, but this was a ton of fun. And um, yeah, super happy to see you crushing it these last couple of years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. We've actually gone 15 minutes over. Damon, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great time. And thank you for talking to me today. Really appreciate it. I will drop your details in the video description so people can find you online. Amazing. Thanks so much, John. Thank Take you. Bye-bye.